Hi. What we're going to do today is talk a little bit about historiography. And historiography is really very simple, but it's a very important term. The, the term really means the study of the writing of history. And as you can tell from the readings that you've already done so far, that is what uh, has been covered. How do historians write about Texas history? And so I want to talk a little bit right now about some of the trends in recent historiography and how those apply to what you're reading now. If we look at the influences on American historiography, we'll realize that early American historians were influenced by different things than historians are today. And one of the themes in this course is to learn what prompted historians to write Texas history the way they did. Now this is looking uh, on the slide right now at historians of American history, but I think the same thing can be applied to Texas historians as well. As early historians were writing about uh, history from their perspective, and so some of the early historians, uh, you see some of the early religious historians writing about being God's chosen people and seeing God's hand or a religious hand in the actions that propelled them forward as they thought. Uh, you also see wealthy historians, patrician historians, that natural laws determine behavior in history, that people and things behaved like they did because of the laws of nature. And then you also have the romantic historians a little bit later. And these people were propelled by nationalism, by this idea of American exceptionalism. And you see this reflected heavily in Texas history as well, Texas exceptionalism. The idea that the nation, in nationalism, the nation is most important and that progress is made with the growth of the nation. And the idea of exceptionalism, meaning that the subject in either America or Texas is exceptional and is different from everyone else. And so you've heard the old saying, things are always bigger in Texas. Uh, and it's this idea of Texas exceptionalism, that things work differently because we live in Texas. Some of the major developments in modern U.S. history have been influenced by science and historians writing about science, uh, by the idea of progressivism, and especially true in the 1930s through about the 1950s, the idea of, of progress, that we're making things moving forward. Look at the time period, though, that uh, these things are happening. So when we talk about science uh, and historians, the scientific historians believe that you could actually find the real truth about history. If you looked at enough documents, if you studied all the facts, then you could write history uh, in the words of one historian, Von Ranke, history as it actually was. And this thought that there was a true history, a history, that was true and couldn't be disputed, lasted up until the 1930s. The progressives were writing from a little bit different frame of mind. And they were writing, look, by the 1930s you have the Great Depression, uh, so this was on their mind, the idea of a stronger government. And so the ideas of making progress, uh, out, coming out of the Depression, recovering from the Depression, uh, and that America would get better. They were also influenced by the fact that, uh, and, and some Marxism, um, and the collapse of the American economy during the Great Depression, that maybe capitalism wasn't the best and the brightest. It wasn't the best thing out there, and that they were challenging uh, capitalism. They also uh, had a tendency to, to, to look at economic factors playing a greater role in history than other historians might have. So that the quest for money, the uh, idea that wealth and acquisition uh, was very important to people throughout history. This was very evident in some of the writings of the progressive historians. By the 1950s, after World War II, you see a new type of historian, and this is called the consensus historian. The consensus historian um, was a bit more conservative. They thought that government was good uh, and the government should be powerful, but that, got, that American people the ver were bringing together various forces. So rather than the conflict that the progressive historians uh, might have seen, uh, people and wealth versus the government, the consensus historians 
uh, we're more likely to see people working together, various groups working together to make a better America or a better Texas. And this predominated uh, American historical thought through the 1950s and the 1960s. By the 1960s, you have different factors that come into play. The Vietnam War, uh, civil rights, the early age of the computer and the age of the space race. And this gives rise to so-called new left historians um, who don't really see government as being good, who, who see it as being maybe too powerful. And in some people might call the new left historians neo-progressives, new progressives. The uh, neo-progressives or the new left historians were predominant through the 60s through the 80s. And they're influenced by what we call the new social history. The new social history deeply influenced by statistics, by sociology. And it's influenced uh, out of uh, a French historical movement called the Annales School. Uh, the Annals was a journal that uh, was deeply influenced by uh, historians who had been trained in sociology, psychology, and uh, various social sciences. And so you see this movement uh, quantifying, looking at not just governments, not just leaders, but in average everyday people. The tape recorder and television also revolutionized these historians, and they put more emphasis not on statistics and quantifying, but also on recording histories, oral histories, with everyday people. And so this is history, some, some people have called it, from the bottom up, looking at it not just at the leaders, but at the everyday people and their lives. So it's this technological influences, the idea of social history uh, and social sciences involved in history, uh, and uh, the use of oral histories as well uh, to increase the scope of documents that are contributing to the histories that the new left historians are writing. Currently today, uh, most people will say we're in a neo-consensus phase. And uh, if you go back to the old consensus historians who thought that big government uh, was good and that government was bringing people together and could help that, the neo-consensus uh, historians are not so convinced that a, a big government is a good government, but they do see that people are coming together more uh, and are writing about different aspects. Now, there probably needs to be a new uh, school of thought uh, now that we've got about 20, 30 years uh, behind the neo-consensus, but nothing is really uh, developed uh, as far as a new school of thought. I think the schools of thought are much more uh, diverse now, and you see a lot of different types of thought coming in to historical writing. Going back to the Annals School, some of the historians of the Annals School are the French historians Marc Bloch, Lucien Febvre, uh, Fernand Bradel, Jacques Le Goff, and others. And they were writing in this journal, which basically means the Journal of History, Annales d'Histoire, uh, and Economique et Sociale, uh, started in 1929. And both of these were heavily influenced by statistics and quantifying data and then um, using that data to look at everyday people's lives. Uh, because you didn't have as many documents from everyday people, you could certainly look at statistics. Now, of course, many of these were collected by government, by tax rolls, uh, by school rolls, and other types of rolls that the government collected, and then looking at what that told us about the past. Another more recent, uh, and this was especially in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, through the 90s, was the idea of race, class, and gender. Race, class, and gender... Historians, uh, influenced by race, class, and gender movement, were looking at how history had been written. And, and predominantly, history in the past was written by the dominant culture, uh, for the dominant culture, by uh, usually college-educated and, and therefore more wealthy, more elite people of society, and specifically focusing on men. What race, class, and gender tried to do was to recast the way history was being written and focus on not just the dominant race but on other races as well, more multicultural. And uh, across class lines, don't just look at the elites, the wealthy, but look at everyday people. And gender, not just men. And now that's gone 
uh, into more LGBTQ issues, uh, looking at history of other and, and gender bending and different types of, uh, uh, of history of um, androgyny, for example, uh, gay uh, history, uh, history of uh, transgendered societies. And so that has exploded. But um, for the most part, early on, race, class, and gender, because the documents were not as readily available for uh, people of different races or of lower class or different genders, um, it, was, it was difficult and has had a hard time getting off the ground in the early years. And I think now it's more infused in history and more accepted. And this idea of postmodernism also, uh, you know, postmodernism can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But in the 1950s to about today, you know, most historians would not say, well, um, we're going to get all the facts and write the truth about history. I mean, what is truth uh, is an age-old uh, statement, an age-old question. Can we really know the truth? Is it more about interpretation? Can we trust the assumptions that we've always been making, and a lot of revisionist histories and, and historians are looking at these old assumptions and challenging them, and we see that more and more today. So I think you've seen already in your readings on Texas history some of these ideas about what has influenced historians uh, and how that influence uh, from the wider world has uh, been reflected in their writing. And I think as you see that more and more, and as you read more and more, this will make more sense and be clearer. And I hope you're enjoying your readings, and be prepared. Coming up very soon is exam one. I'll be posting that so you'll know well in advance what you're supposed to be writing on. Thank you. Have a good day.